gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful, so very, very thankful that you chose us before the foundation of the world. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we are continuing on in our study in the epistle to Jude. And I believe that we were somewhere uh, around verse 11 or 12. Uh, actually, I think we might have made it to verse 13. So we're almost finished with this very... Uh, little but profound epistle. I want to talk first about Samson. Um, many of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the story of, of Samson, how that he went down to Timnah and he saw a woman and uh, one of the daughters of the Philistines and he found this woman attractive and he came back and he told his parents, you know, I saw this woman. Uh, she was one of the daughters of the Philistines. And he asked his mother and his father to, to get her for him as a wife. And then his, his father and mother both said to him, you know, isn't can't you find a woman among the daughters of your 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 own family your own relatives or among uh, your own people you know why why would you go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines but Samson said to his father get her for me because she's looks good to me he obviously wanted her as a wife but what's interesting in the text there is, is it says that his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord. They did not know that this occasion was of the Lord. Now I want you to think long and hard about that as we go through this text. Verse 13, uh, we looked at wandering stars uh, uh, as a, most of you know stars are used to steer by, wandering stars. These are stars that you can't steer by. You know, imagine being a, a sailor and steering by one of these stars where that you wind up so far off course you don't know where you are. And many tend to jump over verse 13. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And we, we were just told, uh, I believe in verse, verse 4, that these were before, long ago before, God had ordained these individuals to condemnation. So now we're looking at, again, at it again. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Oh, but Steve, that, that, that's just not fair. I don't know how many times over the course of my life, folks, that I've heard people say that's just not fair. And folks, when you say that, what you're, you're implying is that there's something good within yourself that would cause God to choose you. Now, you may not... Realize that that's what you're saying, but that's what you're saying. We know that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, and what we are seeing here in Jude is the opposite side of the coin. We're looking at double predestination. Double predestination. Many Christians catch flack for believing in the doctrine of divine election, Normally, that's uh, because we believe that God chose us, but here we're looking at double predestination. I guess, you know, they can, they can hate us twice as much 
you know, I reckon. But that is the biblical fact of the matter. Double predestination. And it, it's as if God said, if you don't believe that I do this, well, I'll just put two kids in Rebecca's womb, Jacob and Esau. And of course, as I've pointed out in previous videos, you know, what some people will say to that is, well, what that means is he didn't really hate Esau. He just didn't love Esau as much as Jacob. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. I, I, I didn't really hate him. I just didn't love him as much as, as Jacob. But that's not what the text says. We've already seen that God had orda has ordained these ones to condemnation in verse 4. Folks, these are very so sobering texts that we're looking at here. Romans 9.22 What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long suffering? the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And, of course, if that's true, why does he yet find fault? And that's exactly what you hear people say. So if we continue reading there in the text, verse 18 of Romans chapter 9, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardens. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy, which He had afore prepared unto glory? It's just the opposite is what we're looking at here in Jude. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. So continuing on in our, in our text, verse 14. verse 14 and 15 and Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these saying behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all uh, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's a lot of ungodliness mentioned four times in one verse. Four times in one verse. I've spent many, many hours contemplating about that. The fact that God mentions that four times. If he mentions something twice, we ought to really take notice. If he mentions it four times, I think we ought to I think we ought to really take notice. I think we should really take notice. That word prophesy is what caught my attention. Prophetuo is the word. Okay, to assert by elevating one statement over another. 
The word properly means to speak forth, speak. Now, the thing that caught my attention, folks, was in comparing that to how the number, the great number of times that I have read the words as it is written in the, in the scriptures. As it is written. Big difference between as it is written, okay, and the word prophesy. The text is not saying uh, that this was written, is, is my point. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, wrote, saying, no, prophesied of these, saying, is what the text says. The Greek says myriads, and it's seventh from Adam, and, and, and I know many of you know just how uh, curious I am about numbers, especially the number seven. And I spent some time dwelling on that fact as well. Of course, my mind immediately reverted, you know, to the, uh, well, there must be some significance to the seven, and maybe there is. But I think that what the text is, is trying to tell us, the thought that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey here in telling us that he was the seventh from Adam is more simple and a little less dramatic than what we might think. It, what it, what it, appear, it, it appears that God wants us to get the right Enoch here, okay? Enoch was... I mean, this is not to be confused with Cain's son, Enoch, okay? The, the text of the book of Genesis says Enoch lived 365 years before he was taken by God. I'm not saying that there's not some connection here, some mystical connection here to uh, Enoch being, uh, you know, representing the rapture of the church because he didn't see death, but, but the Lord took him. I'm not saying that there's not something significant about the number seven, but I think God wants us to understand that this was, you know, you've, we've got Enoch, the son of Jared, okay, and father of Methuselah, I believe. And so he doesn't want us to confuse these two Enochs, okay? After Cain arrived in the land of Nod, we know from the text that where he was sent by God by, for murdering his brother Abel, his wife becomes pregnant, and he bears his she bears his first child, and they named him Enoch. So that's, that's how I'm looking at the text, folks. Verse 15, to execute judgment upon all. All. And, the, and we, we've got to deal with that word all. Of course, I've, I've, I've told people for many years now that all doesn't necessarily mean all. And that's, and that's true. It just it depends upon the context. We know there's no judgment for those who are in Christ. The all has to be understood in context. Psalm chapter 1, first, first psalm. We see that the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Folks, I've said this so many times, our judgment fell on Christ. Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay? For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law couldn't do and that it was weak 
through the flesh, God sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to, to be spiritually minded is life in peace. Folks, listen to, to the words. Oh, dear ones in Christ, listen to me. Law, flesh, carnality, the natural man, self-will, everything that's involved in self, okay? Folks, I am not... I, I, I have no doubt whatsoever that, that I, I am limited oftentimes in my ability to communicate truth that in, to take and paraphrase this stuff, okay? If, I would much rather you listen to what the, the text says, to look at what the text says, and not rely on me to, to, to as much to try to paraphrase what God has said, if you understand what I'm saying. Ungodly. I mean, he, look at the emphasis here. Four times. That's ungodly as opposed to godly. That is, this is not you. Okay? This is not me. This is not us. And have spoken against who? Him. They've spoken against Him. Well, most of the time they speak to us. But they're not really speaking against us. They're speaking against Him. You know, I I expect they'll say, but you know, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't speak against you. If you've spoken against one member of his body, you've spoken against Christ. Okay. And to convince, the text says, that's convict. The word there is convict. All that are ungodly among them. That brought Romans 3.19 to my mind. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, okay? And all the world may become guilty before God. My mouth, folks, has been stopped because Jesus Christ is my advocate. And of all their hard speeches, that's harsh speeches. What are these harsh speeches? Well, one of them is, you know, you must do something to go to heaven. Any speech, any teaching, any preaching that would diminish what Christ has done If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be a curse. Galatians 1.9 Folks, I have a responsibility, a solemn responsibility to not preach anything contrary to what this book teaches. I may not always do that, but that's, that should be my primary responsibility. In fact, I know I don't always do that. I don't have a handle on the truth, but your responsibility, you have a tremendous responsibility to search these things to see if they be so. Not, not go to, run to your pastor to see what he thinks or to your parents who raised you to see what they think or to your best friend or, or anyone else. That's why God gave you that book. 
there are, there are organizations that use the name Berean who are not being Berean. And if what I am teaching, folks, is not the truth, please tell me. Write me, call me, email me. I read in Galatians 6.6, 6, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. That's you telling me, Steve, you've gone off the deep end. The word communicate is where we, we get our word fellowship, to have in common with, that's what the word means, to have a share of, communicate, contribute, impart, have fellowship with. Our common salvation, back up, way back up to the beginning of the epistle, our common salvation, same word. God is going to convince, convict them that their harsh speeches were ungodly. That's not saying that we shouldn't try and convince them through our preaching of the word. But what that says is but, but that it, if, they fail, if they fail to be convinced, it, it, the text says, without a doubt, God will convince, convince them. He will convict them, okay? It's not our job to fret and worry about, you know, them not believing us. Verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. The Greek defines these words as people who are complaining about their situation and arguing that it is God's fault. Ask yourself the question, can God do with you as He wills? Can God do with you as He pleases? You've been bought with a price. You know, of course, one of you millionaires out there will say, well, you know, of course, yeah, you can do anything you want. But that question is not as, uh, uh, as easy to answer when everything seems to be going wrong. Though He slay me, yet will I trust in Him. You are not ordained to condemnation. You are ordained to life. And, and folks, I don't want to act like those who are murmuring or complaining about what God's doing in my life. Do we believe God is working in us according to His good will and pleasure, or do we not? It's just that simple. Do you believe that or do you not? Did you know the greatest testimonies that I've received from people over the years are from people in situations I wouldn't want to be in? You know, the people who've skipped through life with little dif difficulty, you know, very little trials, very little troubles, or at least it appears that way. You know, I'm grateful for them. Okay, I am. I'm, I'm grateful for you if that's, if that's your case, if that's what's true in your case. But to hold the hand of, of an old lady lying in a hospital bed in great pain, you said, Steve, don't look so concerned. My God knows what he's doing. I loved her for that. Yet what I hear so often is God doesn't want you sick. If you're sick, you're out of the will of the Lord. You know, you, you got to snuggle up to Him, you know, and, and then you'll have lots of money and, and you'll, you'll go to heaven. Maybe, maybe. Or, or you haven't given enough money to this church. You know, sow a seed here and God will bring it back seven times. No. Folks, these, these people, they speak great swelling words. The word... is hyperogkos, oversized, greatly swollen, bloated, okay? It's, it's used of one who constantly exaggerates, spewing words out from his inflated ego. That's, that's how the word's used. So let's not forget the context here. The context is ministry. Ministry. They're walking after their own desires, and their mouth speaks great swelling words. 
having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. I think that's one of modern Christianity's greatest faults, having men's persons in, a, in a, admiration because of advantage. If, if you're a real Christian, you'll listen to Blessed Hope Forever YouTube channel. You know, all the rest are, are they're, they're outside the will of God. That's stupid. What kind of God do you worship? I believe that with every fiber of my being, I believe that biblical doctrine is under great assault and that it's going to get worse. Though it's always been that way, all the way back to the beginning. When, when, when Peter had Paul confronted Peter openly, publicly to his face. It's always been this way. It's not, it's not really as much that this is some last days sort of phenomenon taking place. Even though I do believe that we are, we have entered into the age of apostasy. Folks, this is not the only ministry teaching truth, and we are not the only members of the body of Christ. This book is what counts, not the man preaching the book. Holding certain people in admiration for the sake of advantage. Looking back on these verses in Jude, we see something remarkable. We see the Holy Spirit revealing what will normally appear in the lives of His people who agonize over the faith once delivered, which is Christ and what He did on our behalf. We're seeing the, 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 the results of that in the lives of His people and the opposite of that, the other side of the coin, in the lives of those in whom this truth has not solidified. These aren't things to do, okay? We are not under law, but we are under grace. We're not looking at anything to do here in this epistle. Not a single thing. Oh, but Steve, it says we're to earnestly contend for, you know, contend earnestly for the faith once delivered. Listen to me, folks. The, the Bible is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. It is primarily a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. If you're doing what, what, what the Holy Spirit is asking you or commanding you to do here in this epistle, if, if, you, if you believe that that's true, you're not doing that so that God will, the result of that, of you doing that, will be that God will do something in your life. You have flipped that around. You've reversed it. You've put the cart before the horse. The only reason that you're being obedient to the Word here is because Christ has first done. It is the result of what He's done. Are you following what I'm saying here? I know that may be difficult to wrap your mind around, but these aren't things to do. They, rather, they, they're the normal traits that appear in the life of a Christian who is walking by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. To simply view these things as, as instructions, laws, uh, even though they're commands, and though they are God's expressed will for our lives, is to believe that we are under law, not grace apart from the Holy Spirit presenting them as commands, if He didn't do that, we wouldn't have a description, a lovely description of our Lord. We wouldn't have a description of these normal traits that surface in our daily walk as we walk in the Spirit, not the flesh. Not the flesh, which amounts to law-keeping as a rule of life. The very thing God reveals He is opposed to. Apart from these commands, we wouldn't have a picture of Christ. The fact that we... Ha you can look at all of the instructions in the Bible as a lovely portrait of Jesus Christ. It, listen to me, folks. Dearly beloved, please listen. Christianity, there's a, there's a strange paradox 
you know, the up, the way up being down, 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 down into death, death to self, okay? It is. It's, there, there are many strange paradoxes. That it is when we are weak that we are strong. The fact that we have been set apart, preserved, loved, called, shown mercy, have peace with God, re rests on the sole fact that Jesus Christ died in our place, and we can't add anything to that. When God works in a life, there's a result. There's going to be a result. And the result is going to be such that what you, if you're not careful, you're going to be tempted to look at at the results, okay, I hope I say this right, as being the cause. It's not. It's not. That's what most of Christianity believes, but that is not the truth. Who were before of old ordained to this condemn condemnation, and if we are to believe God concerning that, we are forced to accept the fact as well that we have been foreordained to life. Wherein for us there is now no condemnation. If we believe one way, we have to believe the other. As hard as it might be to accept, the Holy Spirit confirms the reality of double predestination a reality that the natural mind finds impossible to accept. The natural mind. Not the mind that's renewed. Which results in the very condemnation revealed here in the text. God's supreme sovereignty and, and election not man's autonomy. The fact that he's sovereign and he, he chooses, we were chosen, elect, in redeeming his people and not redeeming those who are not his, which in our case results in life, stands in direct opposition to a faith that is no saving faith at all, which is the product of death. It is not that death is the result of of their ungodly behavior, but their ungodly behavior is the result of their being spiritually dead. In like man manner, in the same way, eternal life is not the result of our godly actions or behavior. Rather, our godly behavior is the result of our, our having been made alive in Christ. It's beautiful, folks. It's, it's, it's just we've got to to turn our, our minds around and see what, what, you know, first things first, okay? God clearly said He chose to redeem us. Therefore, the very nature, the very nature of divine election demands He chose not to redeem others. We may not like that, but that's, what, that's the fact of the matter. Double predestination. If you can't accept that fact, you must conclude you are forced to conclude. He didn't elect to redeem anybody. But that cannot be true because if it were, the grace of God would be meaningless. And so would the sacrifice of Christ. To despise, to reject, to, de to detest God's sovereign will regarding election and, and label His word in which He says as much label it as, as heresy, is to deny that the flesh profits nothing. It's to say that the flesh profits something, which can only result in the preaching of a false gospel. It, it is just that simple. Scripture has much to say about the danger of despising God's grace, whereby the gospel is transplanted for another, is, is discarded for another. 
and the lives of his people are ruined in the process. And, and it's not about, well, fully comprehending it. Well, Steve, I, I, I just don't, I, I kind of get it, but I don't fully comprehend it. Look, folks, you comprehend it or you don't. It's about either believing God concerning it or not. You either believe it or you don't. It's not it. It's you either believe Him or you don't. The natural man resists those two words, Christ alone. He will fight against that tooth and nail. It's, it's like trying to give a cat a bath. And it is not a matter of intellectual capability. Well, I, you're smart, Steve. I'm not. But a matter of simplicity. Christ alone. 2 Corinthians 11.3 But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of the simplicity, okay, that is in Christ. Oh, but I know a pastor who doesn't believe in election, and man, he's the most loving guy I've ever known. That's wonderful. You got a great friend. But what you're saying is God makes certain exceptions based on human performance. It determines the gospel we are going to preach. It's, you know, well, a, a little law. Okay, that's okay. Just a little law is okay. A little flesh is okay. A little self, that's, that's okay. You know, first of all, folks, it's not a little thing because it determines the gospel that we're going to preach. What message are we going to proclaim? Okay. The gospel includes and it demands God's sovereign will in election. It's always been that case. That's always been the case. I can't. I'm not going to just say, "Well, that's what I just said is true." The gospel demands God's sovereign will in election. John 1:13. That's that's it. There's you a proof text. Okay, just go to John 1:13. You'll see that it's, it's God's will, not yours. Well, that's easy to do. What's a, what's a little harder to do is to try to explain to people that from Genesis to Revelation, it's, the concept is laid out clearly in, in so many ways that we can't even begin to, to fully wrap our mind around it. There's never been one person ever they were saved because of something that they did. Saved because of, of a decision that they made. Not one. Not, not. Every single patriarch, every single individual that, that is mentioned in God's Word, every one of God's people, every single one without exception, were, were elected, chosen by God, Period. And yet, Christianity despises that to the utmost. And I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth whether you love me or hate me. I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't have any other message to give you except what this book says. But it is up to you not to believe it that just because I believe that. You just believe what I believe. Just because believe something I believe. Just because I believe it. Folks, search it out for yourself. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Oh, but Steve, I believe in the gospel. I just don't believe God ordains, elects some to go to heaven and others He, you know, He or He before ordained to condemnation. Well, then you don't believe Jude verse 4. And you don't understand the meaning of the gospel as it was written. That that G Steve, uh, I, I've, I, I know what the gospel is. J Jesus Christ died, was buried, and raised again on the third day. I don't see any election there. Are you really going to handle his, his word that loosely, folks? 
that Jesus died. That infers all that His death implies, it, all that His death meant, all that His death provided, all that His death supplied, not all that His death made possible, if, if you would just do something. As if the outcome were determined by you. If you preach man is born again by his own will or by anything he does, you don't really understand the words according to the Scriptures. Don't, don't, don't tell me. Don't write me, call me, email me and say, Steve, I know the gospel. It's Jesus Christ died, was buried, raised from the dead. And just stop. Finish it. Finish the verse. According to the Scriptures. Verse 4 is not just saying these ones were before ordained to condemnation. It's saying that we didn't choose God. He chose us. Election goes both ways. Yet the banner of modern evangelism proudly waved today is you need to elect God. If, if you will only accept Christ, He'll accept you. But, you know, or some try and wiggle off the hook by saying, well, if... You know, if you accepted Christ, then he, he elected you. You know, you know, they're not Arminians. They're not Calvinists. They're, they're what you'd call Calminian. They figure the real truth kind of lies somewhere in the middle of, you know, of the equation, which is really, in my opinion, is worse than Arminianism. Whatever the case, it is handling the Word of God deceitfully. And if you don't believe that, you know, uh, you're, I don't know, you, if you don't believe that dear old, sweet old grandpa who never misses a Sunday meeting, who would never hurt a fly, who doesn't, doesn't go to beer joints, can believe that he earns his way to heaven, think again. That is why we are challenged not to reach a, a conclusion based on feelings. Ugh, there I said it. You know, feelings. We walk by faith, not by sight. If we walk through this life as a Christian, making judgments based on what appears to be right, we, we folks, well, we've fallen right in step with a world that doesn't know God. There is no greater challenge. You will, not have, you will not find a greater challenge in your life, in this life, than to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. That Jesus died in our place because we belong to Him rather than a provisionary death whereby we might belong we might belong to him well you know if we just finish what he started if we just finish what he began folks i love you all i truly do thank you for all of your love prayers messages kind messages of encouragement and support until next time thanks for watching